Along with uh, many other people on social media, I recently became aware of a live stream dating podcast on the whatever YouTube channel, whatever is the name of the channel. And this um, appeared on my radar thanks to a, a truly delightful clip where a young lady becomes enraged and storms out of the room after a man on the panel says that he doesn't want to sleep with other men. And this is the sort of statement expressing a desire to not engage in homosexual activity that counts as provocative, outrageous in our culture today. I thought the man handles the exchange uh, quite well. Uh, let's take a look. Chase, would you rather smash the hottest trans woman in the world or the oldest woman in the world? Honestly, bro, old, oldest. the oldest woman in the world because then I wouldn't be gay. What? <laughs> you really just want me to uh, just uh, rip you uh, a uh, new uh, one. I swear uh, to God. Are you like... Uh, uh, what? Chase, yeah. how dare you be transphobic? Yes, actually, what the f do you mean? Yes, that was so Because if necessary. I had sex with a trans woman, I'd be having sex with a biological man, and I don't want to do that. The question is, that's not what you said, DM? though. That's fine. Because I'd be say. gay if I had sex that's with a biological gay. man. That's not gay. That's and gay. I don't even care if you're doing this for like whatever, but like shut the f up, actually. I'm, I'm doing you look it like you have a lead to respect why don't, his why don't, sexual identity. That's too far. That's why, don't, too far. why don't you make that's me shut the f up? Because I have an opinion that differs from yours. She's right. I mean, that's really hateful, well, she's bro. Not, she's not. It would technically be homosexual. A trans woman is a biological man. Sue me. It's Dude, that's mean. I, I also no, gotta that's go. It's I gotta not up. It's real. That's it's his. true. Okay, if you guys want to respect factual. gender identities, that's his, though. That's his sexuality. You have any opinions you want, but I'm not allowed to say that. I'm not allowed to say that. Yes, from a biological woman who doesn't even have any trans friends, that was too what? A man of God who doesn't judge a Christian? Yeah. Yeah, you know, you know what God said? It said the man. Okay, suck a fat he made the man and I just told you I'm not gay. I'll pass on that. Yeah. Thanks, though. That's too far, she says. Uh, not wanting to have sexual relations with a man is, is too far. His, heter his heterosexuality is simply a bridge too far for this young lady who, along with her friend, has no choice but to flee the room in disgust. We must admit, though, that she made a compelling argument. To quote her, she says, I don't even care if you're doing this for like whatever, but like shut the F up actually. I mean, that's the kind of quote that would make Mark Twain proud. Such incredible wit and insight and, and, uh, and all of it communicated with such efficiency. Now, we can't blame her really for, for not being able to uh, intelligently articulate her objection to this man's point of view on the subject. It is an unintelligible objection rooted in her unthinking allegiance to gender ideology, which is also unintelligible. But the problem is that every clip that circulates from this show, which seems to feature a different group of young women and sometimes young men each episode talking about their experiences in the dating world, uh, every clip is, is, is just as mind-numbing and displays an equally tenuous grasp on the English language. So here's one that attracted widespread attention yesterday. Um, watch. I think like the biggest thing that like annoys me in like the whole dating world is like talking stages. Like that's so annoying like the whole like and just like the inconsistency in them like i literally like hate that like so much but i think that's like my biggest thing it's just like what what specifically just like the fact of just like you like i don't know how to word this like in like talking stages and it's just like you're like labeled that and it's like people like are considered like you can't like you're just like confused and like most of the time, like, the girl get, gets, like, attached or something, and they, like, see it like it's going to lead to a relationship, and it's always not. And it's just, like, that's, like, my biggest thing is, like, I just hate the whole, like, how, like, talking stages are so, like, normalized. Like, traditional dating does not exist in this generation. Now, I'm informed by others who have endured the clip and who had more time on their hands that she used the word like 27 times in the span of about 48 seconds. I haven't checked their math, but it sounds right. I suppose it's no wonder that the girl doesn't like the uh, talking stage, given that she seems to have so much trouble talking. The unfortunate thing is that what she's trying to express is actually important. It's, uh, it's an important insight that she is trying to, trying to get across. It's just that it gets crushed under the weight of a million likes. She's making the point, or sort of verbally gesturing towards the point, that the total banishment of labels and traditions and concepts like chivalry from the dating scene has left everyone feeling paralyzed and confused. It means that most single people end up in a kind of stasis, a limbo, not knowing whether they're in a relationship or what to do if they are in one or what to call it. 
and nobody knows what to call anything. The fear of commitment that permeates our culture, the aggressive sort of casualness of everything, the insistence on approaching all matters, especially matters relating to love and relationships in a way that diametrically uh, opposes how our grandparents approached it. All of these factors have made the dating scene not simply difficult, but effectively non-existent. People don't date. They just sort of float along on the cultural current, hoping that they bump into another piece of debris before moving on to the next. There's no sense of purpose or meaning. Certainly, there's no clear direction. I think that's what she was trying to say. But instead, she said like that, like, it's all like so like, you know, like so weird, like whatever, like she doesn't fully understand her own feelings on the subject, nor does she have the ability to communicate those feelings. Uh, She knows about 10 words total and can only arrange and rearrange them until she ends up with a sequence that gets the closest to whatever half form thought she wants to express. Now, it's not my intention to pick on this poor girl. She's, uh, she's, she's not a unique or, or extreme case. That's exactly why it's worth talking about. She is rather a typical product of her generation. As nearly every older person has noted, Americans seem to be less articulate with each passing generation. And we're now at a point where some people in Gen Z aren't even proficient in the one and only language they know. They're not bilingual. They're not even monolingual. They are non-lingual, effectively. This is not the same as the familiar old person complaint about youth slang, right? That's not what this is. The issue is not slang. It isn't uh, what words they've added to the English language, but rather what words they've removed from it, which is most of them. We are rapidly running out of words as several generations in a row have taken part in this piecemeal destruction of the English language. The millennials complain about how Gen Z speaks, just as boomers did about millennials, just as their parents did about them. And all of the complaints were valid and only becoming more valid as time goes on. We are, as a culture, progressively losing the ability to express ourselves through language. And this is a rather significant problem, given that language is one of the necessary cornerstones of any functioning civilization. As I've observed in the past, if you really want to see just how much our communication skills, if not our communication technology, I mean, our technology is getting better. Our communication technology is getting better as our communication skills, uh, uh, you know, are, are falling apart. But if you really want to see how it has deteriorated, all you have to do is go and uh, go to like a Civil War battlefield museum somewhere and read some of the letters that average young men, often with little to no formal education, wrote home to their families to describe their experiences. Um, The National Park Service keeps an online database. You actually don't need to go to a museum. And uh, they have a database of some letters that were sent from Antietam and before and after the the, the Battle of Antietam. So I'll I'll read just the first. This is the first one. that If you go to this website, the first one that pops up on the page is, is this. And it's from an infantry private. And this is what he writes. He writes, On the 8th, we struck up the refrain of Maryland, my Maryland, and camped in an apple orchard. We went hungry for six days. Not a morsel of bread or meat had gone in our stomachs, and our menu consisted of apple and corn. We toasted, we burned, we stewed, we boiled, we roasted these two together, and singly until there was not a man whose form had not caved in and who had not a bad attack of diarrhea. Our underclothes were foul and hanging in strips, our socks worn out, and half of the men were barefooted. Many were lame and were sent to the rear. Others of sterner stuff hobbled along and managed to keep up while gangs from every company went off in the surrounding country looking for food. Many became ill from exposure and starvation and were left on the road. The ambulances were full and the whole route was marked with a sick, lame, limping lot that straggled to the farmhouses that lined the way and who, in all cases, suckered and cared for them. Okay, so this is a, a normal guy, not even intending to write something that would become a matter of the historical record, simply describing his experiences, and he does so in a way that is so elegant and descriptive that even if you didn't have any context, you would immediately know that it could not have been written in this century. Now imagine the girl from the podcast trying to convey the same experience. So like we hadn't uh, uh, eaten and like, so like it was, it was kind of like, I don't know how to say it. I I guess like we were hungry and honestly, like it was kind of gross and like literally We didn't even have shoes. I've probably already made the point, but there's one more letter written by a private J.D. Hicks of the Pennsylvania Volunteers, um, and he's trying to describe the horror 
of finding a boy dead on the battlefield. This is how he puts it. Under the dark shade of a towering oak near the Dunker Church lay the lifeless form of a, of a drummer boy, apparently not more than 17 years of age, flaxen hair and eyes of blue and form of delicate mold. As I approached him, I stooped down, and as I did so, I perceived a bloody mark upon his forehead. It showed where the leaden messenger of death had produced the wound that caused his death. His lips were compressed, his eyes half open, a bright smile played upon his countenance. By his side lay his tenor drum, never to be tapped again. So this is an utterly haunting, poignant, downright poetic account dashed off in a letter from some young guy who uh, couldn't have been much older than the drummer boy. In fact, this, the, this guy was 18 years old when he wrote that. This is how people used to communicate. Okay, and, so, and, and you could also find plenty of Civil War letters that, where the spelling is horrendous and the uh, punctuation is non-existent. Because oftentimes, again, these were, these were uh, young men and boys that did have formal schooling. But even in those cases, still, the, the language is, there's, a, there's a, a wide vocabulary that's evident, and the language is often very evocative and vivid and descriptive in a way that people just aren't capable of anymore. That's how people used to communicate. Vividly, descriptively, with words that sufficiently captured the ideas they wanted to convey and the experiences that they wished to recount. We are a bunch of mumbling, inarticulate cows by comparison. Why? Well, for many reasons. People don't read books anymore, and so they aren't exposed to a wide vocabulary. Um, They spend most of their time overstimulated by screens and videos. They communicate mainly in internet shorthand, relying heavily on little pictures, emojis, to convey tone and emotion because they don't know how to do it through actual language. When I complain about emojis, people always think that I'm joking and it's a silly thing to complain about, but this this actually is damaging our ability to communicate. People don't, you hear people say, well, I got to use an emoji because otherwise no one knows my tone. They don't know if I'm happy, if I, you know, they don't know the tone of, uh, that I'm, that I'm using when I, well, you're supposed to be able to communicate that with language. You're supposed to be able to, if you're writing a message to someone, Use words that convey whether you're happy or angry or sad or whatever. The fact that you need the emoji to do that shows a a troubling limitation on our language abilities. And on top of all that, and partially because of it, IQ scores have been declining for years. That's how we got here. Which on the plus side also gives us a roadmap for getting out of the situation. And how you get out of it is do the reverse, basically. Do the reverse of of all that. Put down the screen, pick up a book, use words to communicate, real, complete words and sentences. We'll probably never write as well as a 19th century farm boy on a Civil War battlefield, okay? Most of us will never write that well, but we can improve. I hope we can, at least. Even that girl in the podcast, even she can improve. But for now, because I have to cancel someone at the end of this, that is the requirement of the segment, then I must say that she is, sadly, today, canceled. 